Welcome, I'm Dr. Nick Shikobi. I'm the trans in the college. And um, what that means is I direct a lot of paperwork. A lot of paperwork I get to direct is the what's in each one of our majors. What is each one of our classes as opposed to as, as we've documented all of that um, and helping the faculty of the college, uh, which I'm one of, I teach mostly in cybersecurity. So those of you who are in cybersecurity, I'll probably see you sometime soon if you're not in one of my classes now. Um, but uh, we get to help manage all of that uh, for the college, for each of our majors, whether it's well, cyber where I am or human centered design and development or enterprise technology integration or security risk analysis or information sciences and technology, your data sciences, and you're, if you've got all those words jumbled in your head today, and you're trying to figure out, wait, which is the right one for me, you're in the right place, because that's what this event is about today. Our agenda for uh, this evening is for you to get to meet each of the curricular coordinators for each of our majors. Uh, so Mark Friedenberg is going to talk to you about information sciences and technology, and a couple of the options that you have available in that particular major. Steve Haynes is going to uh, chat with you about human centered design and development. Um, uh, Rosalie Offer is going to talk about enterprise technology integration. Mike Hills is going to follow with security and risk analysis. Ting Wang is going to talk about cybersecurity. Um, and uh, Sharon Huang is going to talk about data sciences. So each one of these faculty members is the standard bearer of the curriculum. They're the people who know the courses and the programs and the way that everything's set up inside, outside, and backwards. Um, and they're the folks that you really want to ask questions of tonight if you're trying to figure out, well, do I go this way or do I go that way? Which is the right one for me? And so sometimes that, that answer comes very quickly. Other times it comes, well, after you've taken a couple of courses and you, and you figure out which major matches or doesn't match for you. All right, so first up, we have uh, Mark Friedenberg. And Mark, whenever you're ready, if you can come on down. Um, he's going to talk to you about uh, the IST major and the various options that are available for you there. Good night, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I have a, uh, the honor of presenting the IST degree to you. I'm a proud alum myself, uh, graduated with an IST degree, uh, and I can vouch for that program as well as all of our programs. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you some slides, but to boil it down, I think the, the IST degree is ultimately about people that's the the key word to take away from the description of the ist major um, it's about people it's about working in teams and solving problems keeping up to date with emerging technologies uh, developing written and uh, spoken communication skills brainstorming ways to fix problems ways to make zoom better and easier to understand getting a foundational understanding of technology, helping organizations come up with solutions that are really tied to the way that, that people think and that people work. More broadly, I think it's a, an approach for a major for people who are interested in a critical approach to issues of technology and society. A lot of our coursework is about policy and law and regulation. And if you look at the news, whether it be in, in TikTok or the New York Times or anywhere in between, you, I'm sure, have seen lots of news stories about a disconnect between the way that people think technology works and the way that they think it should work and the way that it actually works. And if you've ever watched senators or congressmen interviewing a Mark Zuckerberg, <clears throat> they're not speaking the same language, right? They're not asking the right kinds of questions. They're not able to think ahead necessarily to where technology is going to bring our world. So we're going to need you to be able to do that. Some of the skills that you'll get are, are common, I suspect, for most of the programs you'll hear about tonight. Some technical skills, uh, business skills, project management is critical for our degree. Collaboration, problem solving, and, and being able to communicate. For the courses within the IST degree, some of the projects that you'll have to do might be walking through an entire process here. 
understanding users and their needs. That's not unique to IELTS to a degree, but uh, coming up with processes, policies, risks, and impacts for the organization of adopting some new technology or, or changing uh, a rule or policy that the organization has or that government has, uh, like by conducting some meetings, coming up with technical solutions, managing a budget, timeline, scope, so that really exciting stuff, right? But it couldn't be more important team management, um, resource allocation, and being able to communicate the status of a project with a large group of people. And we have all kinds of great technologies to help us do that already. The current lay of the land is that there are two options within the IST degree. And after next fall, there will be one. Some of them are being they've been or are being promoted to their own degrees. So the it's called the information context option, the, the people option will be the core of the IST degree moving forward. And the um, integration option has been promoted into its own major um, ETI, which Rosalie Ocker, close friend of the Nittany Lion, I, I believe, uh, is uh, we'll be speaking to you about, so I don't need to speak much uh, to that. The types of uh, jobs that are available to folks who got an IST degree, pretty broad, but there's a, a great degree of focus. Um, the people who tend to go into this degree are more interested in social issues, policy issues. They're interested in laws and regulations. <clears throat> They're interested in, again, that sort of critical approach to technology. I said I was an IST student. I came here first in 2002. The air around technology and how it would change the world for the better in 2002, very different from 2021. I'd like to think that we've learned a lot along the way, hopefully not too late. And we need folks like you who are going to be able to go out into the world, go out into business or government or academia, and be very thoughtful about the impacts that technology will have on all of our lives. Some of the jobs that people in the IST degree go on to, this is sort of filtered down for some of these recent changes that I alluded to in the options. Um, for people who go to law school from IST, they tend to be in the IST degree. Uh, they'll work in ethics, they'll be um, an IT analyst or a business analyst of various kinds. Lots of firms have a title like that. So those are the things to look out for. But if you're really, again, looking for one way to, to boil down what the IST degree is, it's about people and how can we use technology in a responsible way. Um, thank you uh, very much for your time. I uh, understand there'll be some time for questions at the end, so I look forward to speaking with you more then. <laughs> it's far well, it's either a mask or glasses, but not the can you hear me okay? Can, can the online people hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um my name's Steve Haynes and I'm uh the program coordinator for human centered design development. So I guess the way that I would describe, and I can't move either, I have to sit here. Okay. I can move? Really? Okay. Um, so this, this major, just to sort of boil it down, is for students who want to design and build and evaluate web, mobile, and other technologies. So especially if you like building, building things, designing and developing software in particular, this might be the right major for you. Um, and if you're interested in studying users, designing, conducting, and interpreting data from user studies, so working very closely with users to understand their issues with technologies, perhaps in new domains or, or existing domains, etc. Um, and this major HCDD, you can, you can think of it really as version three of the IST design and development option. Um, it's sort of an evolution of that. 
uh, we're still focused on design and development, but we've added much more UX to the um, to the program. And these are just some of the major topics: the design thinking stage model, social, psychological, cultural, and other organizational aspects of information technology use and web and mobile and other kinds of application development, uh, user experience and user interface design and user research methods. So um, in, in some ways to sort of condense all this, two things that we really want students to do, and maybe that's best explained on this slide, um, is if you look at uh, the bottom right, application development, we really want students coming out of the major to be, uh, to be able to build at least a fully functional prototype. So to design and build a piece of software with uh, a, a user interface uh, that can do something. Um, we also want students to be able to design and conduct a usability evaluation and interpret the data collected from that. And then thirdly, we want students to be, um, to be competent interaction designers. So have some exposure to graphic design, visual communication, et cetera. What, what we really think happens on this on this diagram up here is that students end up somewhere you know um, maybe they're more interested in application development they're really into the more tech tech development end of things or maybe they're more interested in the design um, aspect of of HCDD or or they're into working with users and conducting studies so even though right now the major has a single track. Um, what I'm seeing is that students tend to kind of drift around, you know, not not uh, drift as a group, but every individual ends up at some, you know, sort of different spot in this diagram. Does that make sense? Okay. So just some of the rationale for um, the, the major, uh, uh, just some of the data that we used. Um, you can see it's all pretty positive. I won't read it to you. Uh, you know, we've been, the uh, society has been developing more and more and more technology. In some ways, we've gotten ahead of ourselves in terms of the usability of that uh, technology, and in some cases, the usefulness of, of that technology. So we feel like, um, and this kind of is a little bit different from some majors, we, we have uh, um, a little bit more of a fluid identity. In other words, like I said, on this, on this graphic, students could end up all over this particular diagram with their own individual specializations and then um, there's all kinds of different positions that you might qualify for but the data is good um, you know a few well not a few 10 years ago 20 years ago people were saying that um, uh, software developers were over um, you know it was all going to be automated but uh, let's we're still waiting for that um, here's a bunch of um, positions it's not meant to be uh comprehensive but again like i was saying about that diagram you could end up in all sorts of different locations and there are uh, lots of different potential um, careers available to you some students like i said earlier end up going into uh software engineering positions other students go into program management positions other students go into uh uh, uh, end user research positions and of course students go to graduate school etc but it's a very wide range lots of web development um yeah so a very wide range of potential careers that are available to you um the core the major really consists of two uh parallel threads um one in application development consisting of those courses under the application development book and one in user experience design um, consisting of courses focused on on uh, end user research and uh, interaction design and and studying users so you can think of it as kind of two parallel tracks makes us somewhat unique i think uh, and then the major includes an application focus area so that's 12 credits um, in some uh, in some other discipline related to HCDD. Um, these are what we have now. Um, and we're doing some tweaking of this list. In addition, we have custom application focus areas so you can design your own. Uh, I'm getting quite a lot of requests for those. Um, psychology is pretty 
pretty popular. Informatics is popular, actually. Uh, uh, um, sociology is a few. Security and risk is very popular. Um, and we have a the digital arts and communication AFA is currently being factored into two AFAs, one in digital art and one in communication. And we see a lot of students going into the digital art area. Okay, I think questions come later, right? Is the timing about right? Okay, thanks very much for your time. All right. Here's this part. This part might be a challenge. There we go. I do this. I teach in here, yeah. I teach in here all the time. What did you, what did you say? Okay. Um, Ah, there I am. That was taken at the president's house. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Rosalie Acker, Doc Ock, to my students, <laughs> um, current, and hopefully I'll have all of you in class at some point. Um, I am in charge of the program the new major on enterprise technology integration. It was launched one year ago while we were all remote. So maybe some of you didn't hear about it. So I'm so glad you're here. So what is enterprise technology integration? Well, it links a company software systems and technology platforms together. So whereas HCDD, and Steve, I know, well, Dr. Haynes, I know will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, focuses on a system, ETI looks across systems, right? And so in, an, in a business, in an organization, in an enterprise, all synonyms for the same thing, right, systems, all those things, right? They have multiple systems, right? Multiple information systems. Name an enterprise system here at Penn State that you use every semester. Starts with an L. Lion path. Lion path, right? That system, it's an information system. It spans Penn State, the enterprise. Penn State, right? Faculty use it, students use it, we schedule classes, I'm sure advisors use it. It's a, it's a system that's used by different stakeholder groups across an organization. Okay, so organizations have a bunch of these, larger systems, right? And so ETI takes that that level and we are looking to solve problems and meet organizational needs by linking systems together. Whereas we can develop a system as well, right? But we're looking at linkages across systems. So related, related, all the majors in the college of IST are related. So as students said today, as one of my, um, actually uh, she started out in security, she went is now an HCDD major. As she told freshmen, you know, the actual degree doesn't matter as much as if you like what you're doing, because we have application focus areas and you can take some of cyber, you could take some of HCDD if you were in enterprise technology integration. So you can get flavors of those other things. And just like you saw with HCDD, you can be an analyst, you can be a consultant, you can be, right? Some of these jobs just go across our degrees. In enterprise, arch enterprise technology integration, which has a lot to do with enterprise architecture, how the enterprise works, how the systems work together with each other. 
So you've got to get the systems to work together. You've got to um, share the data. So you're looking at cloud data. You're looking at databases. You're looking at analytics. You're looking at how work gets done in an organization, business processes, how work gets done. That, those processes are embedded in our information systems. So when we design an information system, when we link systems together, we are embedding into our technology how work gets done in a company. So it's very important. Right? So this linkage in ETI that you may not get in the other majors is we have a, a stronger linkage between business and IT. Because enterprise systems run in businesses. Right? So, and why? It sounds logical, right? This is all very logical. You want to link systems together, you want to have good data, you want to share. It's hard to do, it's very complicated. So, difficult to do. You have to be good with people. You have to be good at problem solving, taking something abstract and getting it down to code, right? And you have to do this across many of our majors. It's just at which viewpoint you're looking at the technology. So ETI is broader. Business processes. Business processes span different parts of the organization, right? A business process, how you register for courses. Right? That's a business process. It's instantiated in volume path, right? <laughs> okay. So, I don't have a circle in the middle, but we have IT skills business skills and soft skills. And you ask, doc, doc, what are the soft skills? Working in teams, communication, you're being able to articulate, understand, conceptualize. For IT skills, we focus on data. But data different than a data scientist focused on data. Right? So we have, we do all the programming. Um, our first two years are really synonymous with other majors in the College of IST. Right? Um, you learn how to program on the web to exchange data over systems. You learn about cloud computing. You learn about databases beyond 210. You learn about distributed databases. You learn about managing databases. Admin, you learn systems integration. Making these systems connect, linking them so they communicate with each other. In enterprise analytics, what to do with those linkages and the data that you can get. So those are the IT skills we focused on. So the themes, you know, database, cloud, web. And here's the other piece. This is a new piece. So business skills. Employers want our students to have some understanding of business. Right? And it was lacking. So we added that pull that in here, business skills. Courses offered through the Smear College of Business. It's through their um, business certificate program, which is available to all non-business majors, right? And so you be, those courses are real and they're gut. The accounting class is four credits. Don't mess around, <laughs> serious business. So supply chains, we want you to take Accounting and supply chains, and then you get to decide what else. You can't have a supply chain without integration, 
right? So supply chains, we want you to get some experience in that. Soft skills. Soft skills are necessary to solve difficult problems. How we communicate with people, right? how we lead a team, how we work in a team, right? how we coordinate our work. The number one problem in organizations is poor communication. So many problems stem from that. So if you have a course with me in ETR, you'll hear me talk about teams, teams, teams. Learning to work together. You don't do integration in a vacuum. You are interacting with people. So careers, IT consulting, business consulting, systems integration, systems development. You know, I pulled this off of the internet last night, I think, just before I sent you the presentation, <laughs> consulting careers. So this, I got this at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, when I worked in consulting, it was the big eight. Now it's the big four, plus others. Right? So um, for public accounting firms and consulting, a consulting career will provide you with the opportunity to help clients create competitive advantage by working alongside business leaders to solve their toughest problems. Consulting in general, technology consulting. As a member of their technology consulting team, you will explore innovative ways to help clients transform their business through technology. Transforming, that's a fun word. It's fun to transform things. <laughs> it's fun, right? Okay? Um, technology consultants provide innovative solutions focused on cloud computing and extracting value from enterprise data. You got it, ETI, right? And information systems. And I think I have another one, you know, solutions architect, excellent written and verbal skills, right? Teams, and that's it. Sorry, I didn't have a questions one, but anyway, <laughs> if you have any questions, come and see me. Thanks. Here, Mike. So, handheld mic kind of a guy myself, so I'm going to go with that. I think I got some slides here that Nick made me put together because I think personally he was worried I was going to go over time if I didn't have some kind of boundary. So we'll go ahead and go with that, uh, but I'll probably pretty much talk about what I want to anyway. So uh, we'll go from there. So two basic uh, options in the security and risk analysis uh, major. Uh, and let me tell you, everything that you just heard from all these people, there is risk in everything that they bring to you. And that's, I think, the beauty of the, the college of IST is that there is so much overlap between these programs. You know, there's risk in anything you do. Uh, you get on your bicycle to go to class in the morning. That's a risk. Uh, you know, bad things can happen uh, despite the best laid plans and everything. And really, this program is inherently pointed at dealing with risk and figuring out, hey, all this technology, all the people involved in it, what are the risks associated with that? You heard one example of supply chain uh, and the ETI major and everything. Uh, supply chain risk is a big deal. Look at what's going on right now. Uh, we may not have enough toys at Christmas for crying out loud because the uh, uh, stockyards are so backed up and everything. And there are people that think long and hard about these things. In our intelligence analysis and modeling, the IAM option, uh, a lot of it's pointed towards security concerns, national security being the most predominant. Uh, we've had people who want to work for some of the agencies doing some of that secret squirrel stuff. Uh, you know, so if you're inclined to want to be where the action is, you want to get a lot of uh, interesting experiences, uh, travel, uh, but you don't want to put on the military uniform like I did for 30 years, uh, it's still an option to serve, you know, and you can do a lot of valuable work. You know, you think about 9-11, they talk about that as being, uh, you know, a lack of imagination is why it happened, right? What had happened with airplanes up until that point in time? They'd take one, 
they make it land somewhere, could have a little bit of a hostage negotiation, maybe shoot a few people. Uh, you know, it wasn't a good thing, but that's about the boundaries, right? And then they turned them into human missiles, and it was like, wow, we never saw that one coming. And yet it really was something that we should have seen coming, right? And so this is a actually very creative, if you approach it correctly, major, if you really want to express your creativity, coming up with those scenarios, trying to figure out what is the craziest way somebody could get into our system or disrupt our supply chain or whatever it may be. That's the IAM side. And it kind of concentrates on the technology that you can use to analyze that data. It's almost a data sciences light approach, if you will. You know, data science is really gets into the you know, weeds of statistics and you know, some higher mathematics, but there's plenty of math that goes on at this level too, a little more basic nature that's more looking for trends. Uh, you know, if we notice a pattern, perhaps that's something that we can, uh, you know, assign meaning to. Uh, when I was working with the uh, uh, folks in Afghanistan, trying to figure out where the bomb manufacturers were. You know, they followed the ant trails, they followed the money, they followed all sorts of things to try and find out, hey, does the information tell us anything? Is there a picture we can paint? Can we pull out that solution to this problem and actually reduce the IED hits that we're taking for our forces, things like that. And so you can work in some really interesting areas, but it applies to a lot of other things that aren't military oriented. Okay, I'll get out of my Air Force uh, jacket here for a moment. Uh, talking about the supply chain, you know, you think about it, if I'm a car manufacturer and I need chips to go into my automobile to be able to control all those new GWIS features that they put in it, and all of a sudden that supply is disrupted, I can't sell cars. I can't make money. I can't pay people to do their jobs, right? That's a big impact, right? And it can have incredible financial implications. So a lot of good things go on in that area. And again, some of the tools, the data visualization, I think that's one of the coolest things is trying to put together some kind of an image that takes a bunch of raw data that doesn't mean anything and allows people to make sense of it. And so, you know, learning the tools and techniques, uh, you know, risk management principles is uh, really what this degree focuses on and uh, applies it to in the national security realm, crisis management, disaster relief, things of that nature. So that's our first option. Um, <laughs> the ICS option was almost among the dearly departed. It uh, was on its way out because we had moved to the cyber. You know, a couple of the majors have talked about how they grew into a different major from its humble beginnings. And that's where we were with the ICS option. Uh, the cyber folks were coming back and were giving us feedback that you know, needed to be more technical, needed more technical uh, coursework in there, needed to go a little bit deeper uh, to be successful out in the career area. And so Russ was born in the cyber program. But the ICS option actually gives you the opportunity to do that uh, and make it as technical as you want, if you will, because a lot of the classes overlap. A lot of the classes that you take in the ICS option are similar to or exactly the same as some of the classes that you'll take in some of the other programs. So uh, that's an option that's back now uh, for the foreseeable future. And it's something you might want to consider, you know, if you're a little bit leery of the higher mathematics and you know, I think there's a calculus components and things like that, uh, maybe you want to pull back and consider the ICS option because it looks a lot like risk management, but oriented towards cyber threats. And so figuring out uh, you know, how somebody got into a system, why they got into it, why they attack us in the first place, what did they get, what did they uh, take away from it, who did they sell it to, you know, those type of things are the kind of follow on thing. And again, very much a risk management approach to uh, dealing with some of those IT issues. And then, you know, you think about risk to project management, right? Uh, what happens in projects all the time? Moves to the right and they're over budget every time, right? It's just a risk. It's a risk that goes on in projects. Defining how big that risk is can be important. I worked on the Y2K transition for the nuclear command and control systems uh, for the Air Force. Let me tell you, that was a pressure cooker because Y2K is a hard date, right? Your schedule can't go to the right. And so we were constantly doing updates and assessments of how likely we were to complete those software packages 
to convert all those millions of lines of code into something that would work in the modern era. So it's a pretty interesting work out there for you. Uh, a great pair of programs. And uh, if you want to talk more about them, I'm in town all night. So everybody have a great night. And uh, next up. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, good night. Uh, so um, I'm a coordinator of the cyber major. Um, so what I'm going to say is pretty going to overlap a lot with uh, other folks. Um, so the I think the uniqueness of the cybersecurity major is that you get hands-on uh, on a lot of things. So have you heard about the perennial uh, pipeline as incident happened this year, April? Yeah, so Coronial Pipeline is the largest oil pipeline on the East Coast, right? It got shut down for a few days because um, a group of Russia-related uh, hackers uh, installed the ransomware on their system. So what the ransomware does is they encrypt all your data, and uh, if you don't pay the hacker the money, they will make it unreadable, so you totally lost your data. Right, so essentially, the uh, company couldn't do anything about it and paid the hacker about 4.4 million. So that's the price of the cybersecurity. Okay, so um, we, uh, as a major, we work on kind of focusing on a lot of different aspects of cybersecurity, um, ranging from software, system, AI, uh, human factors. So no matter what air aspects you are interested in, uh, you will find some people to work with. So uh, roughly speaking, the research streams um, are in the, like this uh, six major lines from uh, machine learning to software to network, privacy, uh, data science, and human factors. Okay. Uh, we have a group of uh, research faculty and a group of teaching faculty. So they work in different areas, have a speciality, um, no matter whatever um, interesting aspects of cybersecurity you're interested, uh, you're welcome to talk to any of us, right? Uh, in give you some sample areas. Uh, this group of people, uh, Dr. Palau, Dr. Dinghao Wu, uh, Dr. Ling Han, so uh, Kim and uh, Dr. Hongku, who are working on system and software uh, security. And uh, we have Dr. Nick Galbeck, Kobeck, and uh, uh, Dr. Mike Hughes, who just spoke, uh, working on cyber education. And uh, myself included, Dr. Xiong, Dr. Sigishida, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> anyway, Anna <laughs> and uh, Dr. Jing Fei Chan, who are working on privacy and artificial intelligence uh, related security. Okay, so one more thing I want to um, emphasize. So, uh, even though we are doing a lot of things uh, on research related, right? So, we pay special attention to undergraduate education. So, every year we have lots of undergraduate student involvement activities. This is just one example from last summer. We have this uh, uh, National Science Foundation funded uh, program uh, that working on uh, machine learning plus security last summer. And uh, we recruit a bunch of undergrad students uh, working with us. So if you are looking for these kind of opportunities, please uh, reach out to us, right? And this is a new stuff. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, talk to advisors for understanding about the requirements, right? So we have some changes from uh, last year's 
uh, pretty much summarized here. So we will reduce the credit requirement from 226 to 223, and we will remove some complicated uh, scheduling problems to make it easy to, for you to register our classes. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of classes if you have taken from, for example, uh, from computer science major, from a business major, uh, they can use to for substitution for uh, the requirement of a cyber major, right? So, uh, overall, this is the kind of the syllabus that you are going to face, and there are a lot of flexibilities, right? So. Um, talk to advisor and figure out what's the best for your interest and what's kind of aligned with your career plan, right? So I'll be open to questions on the panel later, right? Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, I'm here to introduce the data sciences major. Um, and um, in this era of big data, you might have heard about uh, data scientists who are analytical experts who analyze massive amounts of data to solve complex problems in business, um, health, care, and among other domains. So you might wonder what is, you know, what is data sciences? Uh, what do science, data scientists do? And how do they use their curiosity and skills to uh, solve problems in the real world? So data science really is the domain that uh, uh, that uses, you know, that's about knowledge and skills that you need to um, explore massive amounts of data, including both structured and unstructured, and to find, for instance, patterns, to find patterns in the data, to automate prediction, uh, of future trends, um, among other things. And you can also use data-driven data methods to help with uh, decision-making, uh, policy-making, among others. Um, and nowadays, you know, big businesses, they all have big data, not only technology firms like Amazon, Twitter, uh, Google, Facebook, you name it, right? So these big technology uh, firms, they all have big data to deal with, but also really all industries, you know, all businesses, organizations, uh, healthcare um, organizations, um, and so, you know, big social data analytics, among others. So there's a lot of uh, big data. And uh, really, you know, how do you use or utilize these massive amounts of data and to use them to help drive uh, decision making, among other things? This is where data scientists come in and uh, they possess the uh, knowledge and skills to uh, analyze the data and then formulate uh, real world problems into these data science problems. And then you, they develop data science solutions to solve these problems, um, you know, in order to, like I mentioned before, make discoveries, automate, this, uh, automate prediction, help with uh, policy making, among other things. So, um, and, you know, how do you, if you want to become a data scientist, how do you prepare yourself? And this is what data science involves. Really, it's part statistics, mathematics, uh, part computational and uh, programming involved as well. And also very importantly, it involves domain knowledge because we need to know the domain knowledge uh, in order to, to be able to communicate effectively with the stakeholders to understand the data, uh, to formulate the problems into data science problems correctly, among other things. So this is what data science uh, involves. And um, really nowadays, you know, if you look at uh, 
data science, it's everywhere. It's in every industry, very important in telecommunications, advertising, insurance, financial services, healthcare, um, among other things. And um, that's why data science is a very, very exciting uh, field, but we can really um, teach students the skills that, need, that are needed in order to solve problems in these, uh, uh, in these industries. And um, here in this graph, you can see the top 20 technology skills in data science jobs. And um, Python, R, SQL, Hadoop, and among other things, and our data science program here at Penn State offer or teach courses that cover a majority of these uh, skills listed here. So for instance, the programming skills, Python R, Python is taught in CompSci 131 and 132. Introduction to the R language is, uh, in, is in STAT 184. And there's also a follow-up statistic course 380 that introduced more statistical-based reasoning to students. And then databases, of course, um, as you've heard from the ETI uh, major and uh, cyber among other majors, uh, databases is definitely very, very fundamental to data science as, as you can imagine. And SQL, uh, this is the, of course, uh, structured query language about uh, relational databases. How do you query relational databases, manage data in these relational databases and so on. And that's taught in DS220, uh, Hadoop, and uh, Hadoop Spark, among others. So these are big data programming models. And we do teach them in DS410. So that's the big data programming, you know, programming for big data course. And uh, data visualization, also mentioned earlier in the SRA uh, major, very important. And we teach that in DS330, um, Tableau, JavaScript, you know, how do you do some web programming, among other things, that's taught in DS330. And uh, I think I already mentioned DS410. Uh, of course, DS310 is about machine learning. Machine learning is a cornerstone technology in, uh, in data science. You can use machine learning. It's a, it's a data-driven problem-solving paradigm. So uh, here, what you do is you collect a large amount of data, massive amount of data, where you observe what is the input and what is the output. Um, so for instance, you know, I'll give you an example uh, in prediction, let's say autonomous, autonomous driving, very easy to understand. Your input could be a video stream and your output could be uh, directions to, to the car, you know, like how do you drive in the next step and so on. So you have these input to output mapping and the machine learning really provides an automated way to learn that mapping from input to output. And that, that's why it enables prediction as well. So for instance, another example is the stock market. If you get some historical data about a particular stock and, uh, and you learn, you know, based on the, let's say past 10 months and you predict the next seven days, something like that. And when you've trained your machine learning model, then given uh, new data coming in, um, you know, you can try to predict, for instance, what's going to happen to the stock in the next uh, seven days, something like that, right? So that's what machine learning is. Uh, sorry, I, I said a lot about it, but it's a really very important course, and we teach that. And um, here, this is a bird's view of the courses offered in a data science major. You can see, it, like I mentioned earlier, this programming and algorithm course, and there's the math and statistics core, and we also have um, uh, courses developed just for data science, very focused core courses like um, how do you do data management, machine learning, how do you integrate data that come from a variety of sources, how do you realize data in an effective way, um, big programming models for big data and so on. So that's the core. And we also want to use data science in a, a safe and ethical way. So we have two courses dedicated to privacy, uh, security and ethics of data science. And of course, there's the capstone and then some very, very interesting data science elective courses. Um, and the applied data science option, uh, it's very unique. We have the uh, application focus areas. And uh, through these application focus areas, we allow our students to get exposure to one specific domain of interest. Uh, we develop like the other majors from IST. Um, there are application focuses, for instance, um, if you want to major, you know, if you want to have 
um, take some courses from other majors in the college, you can do so. Like there we have a cyber analytics focus area. Also we have a focus area for a human centered design and development. And if you want to learn more about business, then you can take courses from the business certificate, for instance, or take some courses from economics. And there's also others like uh, psychology, uh, food science, nutrition, and astronomy, among other things. It's, it's really because in data science, as a data scientist, you learn the knowledge and skills where you develop uh, new data science methods and tools to solve problems from a variety of domains. And then, you know, in our program, we want to um, have our students to have the opportunity to actually practice what they learn and apply their data science skills to, um, you know, to look at a particular problem from an application domain and um, formulate their problems, solve the problems, evaluate this, the effectiveness, effectiveness of their solutions and so on. So here really, again, emphasizes why domain knowledge is important because it really enables the data scientists to talk to the uh, stakeholders in an effective way because they can, you know, they should be able to talk to them using their language. They should be able to understand um, the data from that particular domain, use them in the right way, and also solve them in a way that really addresses the target user's uh, requirements. So these are some additional um, insights about you know, why it is important to have that application domain knowledge. And uh, this is a, current, a, a list of recommended application focus areas. Some of them are more well developed than others, like the ones on the left-hand side, uh, they're very well developed. We already have a lot of data science students who take these uh, focus areas. Um, uh, on the right-hand side, we have several that are also very well developed. And uh, there are others, you know, we want to develop them more, uh, have them maybe appeal to more students. Uh, for instance, sports, uh, we're in the process of trying to develop a dedicated sports analytics course, in addition to courses that students can choose from sports minor, the sports study minor. Okay, so that's the focus area we're, we're doing. Um, yeah, so these are some examples. For instance, this is an example focus area in business analytics. And this is the um, focus area in psychology. The way you choose these um, focus areas, uh, I actually got this from our advising office. Uh, I, I believe your advisor tell you too. I think a very good way of doing this is really to ask yourself, um, what, you know, what domain are you passionate about? What do you want to apply your data science skills to solve problems the most in? You know, which domain you're most interested in? And then go in there and uh, you can take a couple low level courses like the introduction courses to see whether you really like it or not. And it's whether it's uh, aligned with your, with, with your future career goals. And once you've decided on which domain or which um, area you want to focus on, then you can go into, you know, we have some recommended courses, but you can also just go to the course, uh, the university bulletin, look at the course catalog, look some 300, look at some 300, 400 level courses. So let's say, you know, because we have the requirement of two courses at any level and two courses at 300, 400 levels. In that case, if you find your 400 or 300 level courses where uh, you want to take, you know, let's say you take two, choose two of them and then you look at their prerequisites, that usually take, take at least, you know, a, a, they, they would have at least one or two prerequisites. So you take those 300, 400 level courses plus their prerequisites, that will give you the focus area, right? Um, and mo most recently, um, the um, advising office, they have developed this uh, smart sheet form. It's very easy to submit your focus approval request. And uh, just a form where you ask, you know, you fill in the courses that you have chosen uh, either, you know, the courses could, you could have already taken them or you plan to take them. It's a, could be a combination of both. It will be okay. As long as you say, these are the courses I want to take. And here's the rationale for me, you know, to choose this particular focus area. So that'll be good enough for the uh, program coordinator and advisors to evaluate your request and consider approving. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think most of the students here are, does, are University Park students, right? But, oh, okay. Yeah, for students who are online, if you're considering two plus two, um, and if you want to major, you know, if you want to come to um, University Park 
in your third year for the data science major, uh, these are some courses you can consider taking in your first two years. Uh, and they are available on DLC, digital learning cooperatives. You can ask your um, you know, uh, professors and advisors and see how you can get registered in this. Um, the first one is DS120. It's a one credit Python scripting course. Just in case if your campus does not offer a course in Python, um, let's say you study another language like C, C++ or Java, then before you come to University Park, it might be very beneficial if you take this one credit Python scripting course so that you get familiar with the Python language, okay? Because a lot of the data science courses will use Python. Uh, this, you know, DS200, this is the, the kind of the introduction, introductory course to data science. Um, this is offered via DLC every semester. The DS220 course, the pre data science prerequisite to a lot of other data science courses, that is also offered via DLC at least once a year. Uh, I think right now it's a once, you know, every semester we do have one section available. And, uh, and just, just recently, STAT 184, Introduction to R, is also made available via DLC starting in spring 22. So definitely look into that. These are the options you can consider in your first two years before coming to University Park. Okay, that will be all for data science. Thank you. All right, so now we're up to the questions and answer phase of the evening. Uh, diplomats, if you don't mind coming up, because I think we might ask some questions of you. These are our students who've been in the college for a while. They, they've been through the ropes. If you have questions for these folks, please, please, please ask them. We have a whole bunch of, um, of pre-submitted questions that are a lot about the majors and whatnot, and we'll kind of work those in a little bit. Uh, we'll also keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so we have a couple of people who've asked questions already in the chat, um, and we'll try to work our way through these. And the coordinators as well, and we're going to run some microphones back and forth uh, to different folks uh, who might have some questions. And Susan, if you can help me with that, that would be awesome. Okay, let's go with our first live question. We're going to do a pre-submit. Want to do your first one online that you have? Yep, yep, yep. There we go. Are well, you all up there thinking about your questions as well? Okay, go ahead. Okay. What kind of programming languages are used at the HCDB major? Well, I think that's a Steve Haynes question. <laughs> uh, who's up right up behind you? So what kind of programming languages are used for the HCDB major? Okay, so um, uh, as of today, the, the, the core uh, learning teaching and learning language is Java. Um, You'll also do HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the web programming side. For the mobile development course, we're using React Native. And we don't have Python as part of the curriculum, but um, I, Sharon mentioned the, um, the, the one credit scripting language course, and we would recommend you at least do that as well. So Java, JavaScript, uh, React Native, HTML, CSS. And maybe some Python. And maybe some Python. But that's, yes, all of all of the above, right? The Java, Java, Java uh, to get started. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. That was our first question pre-submitted. I'm not seeing any hands up here in the room. Oh, there's one right up there. Go to our next question. Maybe this is a question for our diplomats. For any um, human-centered design and development students, have you thought about like any concern for like the future of software development and like whether or not it would be automated at some point? So this is a question for diplomats and somebody who's a software developer. Also. So I am oh, curious. I'm a human side design development major. Uh, that question is actually really interesting. Um, I don't think we we really dabble into that, but it, I did hear that, and I was thinking about how crazy it is to think that it could be automated. Um, I know for me currently, one of the classes that I think is pretty general across most of the IST majors is IST 402, 
which is like a seminar course. And the one that I am currently in LA for, we are talking a lot about algorithms. So a lot of this semester for me has been talking about, well, what, uh, what is automated? How can we automate things? What's the dangers in automation? So to answer your question, I don't think I've ever really thought about it, but I do think a lot about how we can design like our interfaces to be better in a way that will take a lot less work for the, both the people using them and also for the people programming them, you know, ways to make it easier and ways to make it more efficient. Awesome. Let's take our next live question here in the room. Yeah, go ahead, all you. Um, any of you can answer. I was going to ask, how did you know that your focus was for you and not any other focus? Hmm. Hi, so my name's Andrew Pacheco um, and I'm a, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, cool. And I'm a senior studying ETI. So um, I'm the ETI rep here. And I thought that the ETI major was for me because I do like the idea of considering big picture problems and technology, but I also like the idea of working with um, business partners and people um, that are actually using the things that we plan to implement and integrate. So um, I really liked both sides of the, of the coin. So not only working with the tech, but also working with the, the people that use it. So I actually have one of the custom focuses because I didn't think any of the focuses were right for me. Um, so I'm, I'm majoring in applied data science. I'm not sure if you can do that with every major or not. Um, but, oh, you can. Okay, cool. Um, but I'm minoring in digital entrepreneurship, which is my focus as well. So I really fell in love with this minor because I was also interested in the business aspect and design thinking and creativity as well. So having that focus, I thought really fit my career path. Alrighty, so we're gonna go take our next question from one of our pre-submitted questions. Um, and this one kind of gets down to um, uh, some nuts and bolts over in our software development courses. So it's for Dr. Haynes. And the question is, what is the difference between IST 240 and IST 242. So if there's a student who's who's considering one of those two options, what would you tell them about it? Um, okay, that's sort of an interesting one. Um, I, I would, I guess I would just be honest um, and say that IST 240 is really kind of a legacy um, course. It's filling a gap that um, that doesn't almost doesn't exist anymore. Um, Right now, 240 would probably be most appropriate if you took IST 140 and had a really hard time with it um, and wanted to take more Java at a slightly slower pace before taking IST 242. So I'm not sure if that's the official story, but that's my story. Now, we also have some students who are online who might have done something a little bit different. They might have started off maybe in a computer science class, maybe in Python, and, and then they're gonna head to, to Java because they wanna do um, the HCDD major or, or other majors in the college. How would uh, IST240 help them? Uh, is, is 240 on the path between 132, 131 and, all right, so they'd need to do 240. Right, they do 240 as kind of yeah. a transitional course. Potentially. Yeah, as a to, to transition into Java from Python. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you very much. Thanks and for reminding me. Do we have another question submitted online? What is the average salary for ETI majors? And is it a disadvantage to students in this major since it's so new? Hmm. That sounds like a good question for Doc Ock. Dis Advantage? No, no, it's not a disadvantage at all. Um, it will be ETI will become a very popular major, like the option two in IST was um, very popular. Uh, ETI is a more um, stronger technical um, foundation in um, from IST coupled with business and. 
companies who recruit over in SNEL for systems people come right over here and, and um, recruit you, right? You offer, uh, as ETI, you offer a more um, solid technical foundation than maybe an MIS major in SMEAL. And it's a different, it's a different animal. We are systems people here. So money, um, I, I don't, can't answer that. It's competitive with all the other majors. I think a lot of the money question often comes down to where you end up working right. to, like the city right. that you might end up working in. But um, we don't yet have an ETI graduate. Well, we have no, but we have uh, integration, and, integration graduates. Yeah. And, and uh, what's the average starting for the college, 65? Uh, actually, it's actually much higher than that now. It's 75? Yeah, even higher Okay, than that. so we're in there. We'll be in Absolutely. there. You're going to go like, but I worked in um, for what is now Accenture, one of the big consulting firms in New York City. So, you know, you're going to be in demand very much so. All right. Oh, we've got some questions right in the front. Behind Just behind you. you, there's a microphone. Okay. So, um, Kyle, you were saying how like um, the SMEAL certificate went, went with the ETI uh, major. How is that different from like a business minor or yeah, just like a business minor. Oh, it's like a okay. Oh. Okay. So for those students online who uh, wanted to hear that answer, uh, yeah, a business minor is more work than a business certificate. But here's the dirty secret about Penn State: at the University Park, there is no business minor. Okay, that's why I was kind of thinking. Yeah, so the, the, the business certificate fits into that void, and it's the right thing that matches up with the ETI major. <laughs> Rosalie was looking better. So what, what, what I didn't say before is that with ETI, you can have that additional credential of a certificate from SMEAL in business. And I have a student now who's also getting the real estate license. <laughs> so. Students do a lot of interesting things. Okay, next question from in the room. So uh, when you look at um, cybersecurity and SRA, since I'm, yeah, you're fine. Since I'm kind of like looking at both of them, I was wondering if you can go into more detail the difference between those two. Like, is there any like sort of interests you have that, because I kind of feel like they're kind of similar. So I was wondering if there's well, anything. Let's give that one to Mike Hills to start with. If I understand your question, right, and let's keep me honest on that as a starting point, so don't be shy. I think you're asking about the ICS option of the SRA degree versus the cyber option. Is that what you were asking? I think I'm only, like, or are you talking about the IAM major versus the ICS option in the SRA major? Uh, kind of like, no, sort of like the, the cybersecurity major like versus the SRA I guess. Cyber. Okay, so you're asking about the cybersecurity major versus the SRA major. The SRA major has an option in it that's very similar to the cyber. The difference is mathematics. I think you require calculus in the cyber. Yep. And there's more programming. A lot more. And quite a bit, you know, more robustness to it. Um, I would characterize the ICS option in the SRA degree as being more for a technical manager than, you know, a hard pound and keyboard, you know, penetration tester or something like that. So that's the prime difference between the two. Now, the intelligence and modeling um, option in the SRA degree, totally different animal. I wouldn't even compare those two. Um, so does that hit what you were asking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're going to hit more math. You're going to hit more programming. You're going to get more and more and more because the cyber option came as a result of people getting out into the world and not having enough of those experiences to compete at the level that they wanted to. Okay. Um, so this question is about the data sciences major, um, whether 
COMSCI 131 or Data Sciences 200 was a better indicator of if I would enjoy the major um, as a whole. So like which class is most like the other classes I would be taking. Yeah, so um, I'm looking to schedule classes for the spring. I'm looking at uh, DS 200 and then COMSCI 132 because I'm taking 31 now. And I really want to work with people as just like in general. And I think COMSCI 131 is more um, like technical and not so much working with people. So would DS 200 or 131 be a better indicator of if I would enjoy the major, like as a whole? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Whether you would enjoy the data science major overall? I think DS 200 is a better indicator. Okay, so yeah. that's more like what I would Yeah, we, we have on. the COMPSA 131 and 132 uh, offered by the computer science department. Uh, mm -hmm. They teach Python programming. And those typically are larger classes as you may <laughs> have experienced. And once you take the DS courses like DS 200, DS 220 in the college of IST, um, these sections are much smaller. Yeah, we I mean, typically I think it's somewhere between 40 and 70 is the most typical. So you have, I, I think the DS 200 experience is a better indicator. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, once you get into the DS classes, it's a lot more group work. I know 131 and 132, it's a lot more solo type of projects. And it's not, as you go forward, it's not like that. You'll be working with partners or groups a lot more. Mm -hmm. All right, so next question I'm going to take from our uh, pre-submitted question list. Um, and I'm going to answer it. So um, this one goes out to all of you at the campuses. So where's the, the camera that might be on me? Is that that one right there? Um, apparently it's pointed over this direction, that's okay. Uh, so the question is, in the two plus two program, can we go to the main campus before completing our last few prerequisites for our major? And so the challenge with that is all the entrance to major courses for the major you wanna be in, uh, have to be completed before you do the, the switch to University Park. Uh, so you can put in the application in that last semester that you're doing them, but then you come up to University Park the semester after you've completed the entrance to major courses. And pay attention to the entrance to major um, credit window. That actually goes for everybody here. Make sure you look at the credit window for your particular major of choice uh, and that you complete your entrance major requirements within that window. Uh, so you can't do it too early. And if you do it way too late, then you can't get into the major. So I'm sure everybody up here, are, you've already done all that, right? Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're looking at that, uh, was it 40 to 70 credits uh, for each of our majors that has a control on them? Uh, so make sure that you, uh, that you pay attention to that. Okay, uh, let's see if we have another question here in the room. We do, right over here. Uh, oh, it is on, cool. Uh, so this is a question regarding the cybersecurity major. Uh, I'm actually a third year, so I've already declared uh, okay. my major, but in these almost three years that I've been studying it, I feel, I still feel like I don't fully know exactly the types of things that uh, people with the major do on a surface level, like when they're actually on the job. Uh, so I guess I know this is going to, this answer is going to vary based on, you know, the focus area that you choose, but I guess my question, I wanted to ask uh, if there are any examples that you guys could give of uh, just day-to-day uh, -day things that people would do uh, who have a cybersecurity uh, major who actually have a cybersecurity job. Okay, any of our diplomats? Yeah, I was like, um, I'm Sydney, I'm a major, um, Sydney, I'm senior major in cybersecurity, my brain's not working, I apologize. Um, it really does depend, and I know that's not a very helpful answer, um, but I think IST gives you a lot of the baseline tools that you can use, and then the specifics come depending on which job you're in. Um, so my internships have both been very different. One was much more research focused, one was much more coding focused, um, but both of them were big group projects, which IST prepared you for, but I think the specifics of what you'll be doing and what you'll be working on in those tools, you'll probably learn when you get there, um, depending on which job you wanna go into. And I could add a bit to that because I'm in touch with all of our graduates uh, from the cyber major. Uh, I teach the capstone course and I get to see where they, they end up going. And um, 
one student very recently got a job at a major pharmaceutical company and he's telling me about that and uh, he's going to go off to uh, do um, uh, endpoint management security so all the computers all across the whole organization and all the antivirus and control mechanisms and patch management and all those other kinds of tools all feed lots of data to a centralized log server. And then how do you manage that for an entire organization across the globe? Uh, so it's really pretty interesting uh, opportunities. Uh, one of our other graduates uh, does identity and access management for, for an insurance company. So, okay, yeah, certainly user accounts and that kind of stuff. You look at that and go yawn, but it's actually really pretty exciting. And there's some really awesome tools to, to help do that job. Uh, every one of the students that graduated in the last, uh, well, the first two classes of cybersecurity, they've all gone to go do something different. Um, and uh, so it really is, like uh, has been said, it's up to you and up to the organization you're going to go to work for. We have one for online. Okay, go ahead. Is HCDD a good major for someone who wants to be both creative and logical? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more. Um, yes, it's probably, um, uh, uh, yeah, one of the majors where you'll have the most opportunity to do those two things for, you know, the, as I described earlier, there's kind of an application development thread that involves quite a lot of programming, um, um, you know, much of, much of that work involves logic. Um, uh, and then the other thread, the user experience thread, uh, especially if you were to do something like DART, digital art as your application focus area, um, there's uh, lots of opportunities to be creative there. That sounds awesome. I will also uh, just chime in for really quickly on that point. Um, I definitely think it's a great way to be creative. I know I joined the major because I was really concerned about just like sitting and coding because I knew I wanted to keep interacting with people and be a little bit more face-to-face. -face. And when I got to do my internship, I got to interview people from all over the world to be doing user research, figuring out how we could improve this application I was working on. And I definitely got a lot of creative freedom and I got to do a lot of prototyping. So I definitely think it's a really good mix of like both the programming side, but also just some inherent uh, creativity and like freedom to kind of design and figure out how you're gonna make things better. Very good. And we have just another to, one. Oh, one. Sorry, just to add on to that quickly. I'm an ISC design and development major, but that's like the legacy version of HCDD um, because I'm old. But um, what I would add is that I think you can like, especially when you enter the workforce, you have a lot of control as to how creative and how technical you want to be. And if you want to like do both, you certainly can. But like, I would say that personally I'm more on like the technical side of things because that's what I prefer but there are people who are the opposite and then there are people who are like in the middle so you have a lot of control over like what interests you where you want to go with it sounds like there's lots of choice and it's all driven by what you want to do okay let's do our next online question how well does the applied data science major prepare graduates for industry? Is it likely that they get a relevant job right after graduation? Okay, so I'm going to wander down here and give the mic to Sharon Huang. Yeah. Oh, did I turn that on? There we go. Honestly, uh, yes, um, our students, our program prepare our students very well for the industry. Um, we have, uh, so as I mentioned earlier during the presentation, we have courses. So you, you've seen the industries where big data is very important and the te technologies, the technology skills that are required to solve those um, data science problems. And we cover them in, in various courses in the data science program. And uh, programming wise, and you know, uh, we prepare students for the statistical foundations. And we also have the, um, capstone courses that will really integrate all the technologies and, and knowledge and skills learned in the data science program and help students to solve real world problems. I think that diplomats can answer better that question as well. And they get internships, uh, internships and jobs, yeah. 
Yeah, so I have had two internships and one was more IST, like IT based, and then the other was more data based and I felt very prepared for those. So it is nice that you have the range of skills for if you like the IT rather than like solely data, you also know how to code and you can work with that. But if you want to do more database stuff, which is what I wanted to do. So for my second internship, I chose to do a data analytics specific one. Mm -hmm. And honestly, as a, I'm a senior now, so as I've gone through the years, I've seen a lot more data science internships than whenever I was a freshman, which is really nice. So there's a lot more options in different industries now. Yes, we do have, uh, I also teach a freshman seminar course in data science and some of our data science students get internships right after the first year, uh, which is great. And then they get follow up internships during the follow up summers and then they get exposure in industry and that would definitely help them get prepared uh, for the real world. Um, I've not seen a whole lot of hands in the room. So I think we've got one more online. Let's uh, take that one. Demand is there for cybersecurity professionals. Also, how much do you think the space will grow over the next few years? Ting, are you interested in that question, or do you want me to take a crack at it? It's going to come down. Um, I can start. Um, cybersecurity is in huge demand, um, and it's making the news more and more every day, which I think has helped the demand grow, and I think it will continue to grow um, as technology becomes more and more important. Cybersecurity becomes more important with it. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of gaps between technology and security. Um, and I think more people are more aware of it. So the demand for cyber is huge. You can literally go in almost any industry you want in cyber because everyone is online and everyone needs cybersecurity. Um, so that's amazing. There's so much flexibility and there's so much demand for it. Okay, uh, so I can add up a little more. Um, so the, I think the cybersecurity is uh, is a, a very unique thing. It's quite, it's quite sticky, right? So um, when you think about how new technology being invented, people first first will focus on its functionality, right? Make it work, make it uh, you know easy to use, etc. Right? Then later on, people folk find out actually there's some vulnerability in it, right? Uh, maybe bad people will exploit such kind of vulnerability and do all kinds of weird things, right? So if the if the technology keeps moving, right, we have new products, you have we have new services, we have new uh, technologies being coming out, then you know we will have new problems for for cybersecurity. So you don't need to worry about your uh, losing losing your job, right? Because there are always something new, right, being invented every day. So I guess uh, what uh, this program offers is um, to train you have a mindset, right? This kind of mindset is how to understand what's vulnerability in it and how uh, malicious people might exploit and how to defend against that kind of actions, right? So I think this space is huge and uh, it, it, it will become increasingly important. And I was just looking up some numbers. Uh, it was an organization known as Cybersecurity Ventures, and they came to a conclusion that by 2021, there will be 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs. So, yeah, there's lots of demand. Lots of demand. 2.8 million a year ago is now up to 3.5 million this year. Next year, it'll be 4.7, whatever it's going to be. It's going to be a crazy number. Um, I'm wondering the difference between HCDD major and application focus area in ETI major. Okay, so the difference between HCDD major and then a, a student who would do the ETI major and would be doing an application focus in what? In HCDD? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think. Okay. So. Well, there's yeah. lots of questions to figure out. <laughs> that's that's an interesting set of questions. Let's start with Rosalie on that question. Um, it depends what you what you really want to focus on, right? On the level, could you do ETI with a degree in HCDD? Yes, yes. Vice versa, maybe. You know, um, 
with ETI, you get a more macro view of the world across the organization, which in itself is very interesting because as a systems person in a big organization, you have to learn all about the organization and all the different parts. And so it's pretty fascinating that way. Uh, were you asking in both directions? So HCAD is a major and ETI is a application focus area and yeah. vice versa? Yeah, because I'm interested in like both like business and like application development, so yeah. Yeah, um, well, I guess you'd need to, you know, as Dr. Acker just pointed out, you'd sort of need to decide, uh, unfortunately, that um, which, which you really want to be your focus. But I think either, either way in combination, they're both really good combinations. Yeah. Yeah. The one, one thing I think about, and if I think about the differences between the two, um, for ETI, I think about the people side of it being the organization side of it. ETI being the trying to figure out what the business process is that you're trying to model and then create in those cloud based systems with lots of databases. From the HCDD perspective, I might think about. Well, that one user who's sitting in front of that particular screen, how do I make that software do the things that they need to do? And while you could be like, right, right, well, that screen could be really small in your hand or the computer screen or a variety of others. So um, the people part of it is the way I think about it differently. One from maybe one user perspective and the other from a larger organization perspective. Maybe that's but a little simple. But we definitely think about more than just a single user. Sure because almost every application that's developed has lots of users now is yeah. some sort of a collaborative system. So you, you, you really can't just, you know, what so you're started, saying I've oversimplified it yet again. Well, when I first started doing this, like in the 1980s, then it was really, you know, one user, one computer type, right? Thing, but not th there's very, very few systems like that anymore. Well, I think we are at about time. I want to thank all of our panelists, especially our diplomats. Thank you very much for coming up. And, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with them. If you have questions, you can do that. And we have our coordinators who might hang out for a little bit as well. For those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to us, uh, talk with your advisors to, to get in contact with, uh, uh, with any of the coordinators, and we'll try to make those things happen. Yep, so go to IST Advising uh, for that. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We will see you all soon. Bye-bye.